Greetings and Shalom Havarim. My name is Ron Smith and you are listening to us give you some direction in Torah portions. You are tuned in to www.sminspire.us. Again, that is www.sminspire.us. And we are happy to come to a parasha or portion of scripture called Toldot. Toldot means history, uh, uh, storytelling, uh, generations, that sort of thing. So, we're going to get right into it. And this is uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 19, all the way through chapter 28, verse 9. And I'm just going to finish the rest of chapter 25 this time around. It's a mere 15 verses, but let's go ahead and read this life story and then we'll kind of get into a little bit of study of it. It says in verse 19 of Genesis 25, Here is the history of Yitzhak, Avraham's son. Avraham fathered Yitzhak. Yitzhak was 40 years old when he took Rivka, the daughter of Bituel, the Arami, from Padam Aram, and sister of Levan the Amri, to be his wife. Yitzhak prayed to Adonai on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Adonai heeded his prayer, and Rivka became pregnant. The children fought each other inside of her so much that she said, If it's going to be like this, why go on living? So she went to inquire of Adonai, who answered her, Quote, There are two nations in your womb. From birth they will be two rival peoples. One of these peoples will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time for her delivery came, there were twins in her womb. The first to come out was reddish and covered all over with hair like a coat, so they named him Esav. Then his brother emerged with his hand holding Esav's heel, so he was called Yaakov. Yitzhak was sixty years old when she bore them. The boys grew, and Esav became a skillful hunter and outdoorsman, while Yaakov was a quiet man who stayed in the tents. Yitzhak favored Esav because he had a taste for game. Rivka favored Yaakov. One day when Yaakov had cooked some stew, Esav came in from the open country exhausted and said to Yaakov, Please, let me gulp down some of that red stuff, that red stuff. I'm exhausted. That is why he is called Adam, meaning red. Yaakov answered, First, sell me your rights as the firstborn. Look, I'm about to die, said Esav. What use to me are my rights as firstborn? Yaakov said, First swear to me. So he swore to him, thus selling his birthright to Yaakov. Then Yaakov gave him uh, bread and lentil stew, so he ate and drank, got up, and went on his way. Thus Esav showed how little he valued his birthright. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for this portion. Thank you for the, uh, the meat that is in it that we can take with us today. The, the stuff that we can learn from this portion. And even in this part of this portion, we ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us, guide us, give us indeed revelation. So that it may become fresh and new in our lives today so that we may have the freshness of your Holy Spirit with us ever renewing us and ever even renewing our minds so that we be not conformed but rather transformed we are grateful for the leading of your spirit Bishem Yeshua in Jesus name Amen well this life story is that of Yitzhak who like his father had problems to overcome base and even warlike behavior behaviors and uh, perhaps as well as the uh, greed of his boss or father-in-law will become parse, par, part and parcel parcel of Isaac's challenges. We remember that uh, the first time Toledot is spelled fully the word Toledot meaning generations here usually Bibles will translate it that way is spelled fully in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 speaking of the generations or history of when the heavens and earth were well more together. Toledot is spelled defectively 
after that and until Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, even though there is actually one little spot in between that is different, and I will probably point that out later on, maybe even in the next reading. The whole of the Bible is the history or Toledot of redemption. Well, let's talk about a rather passionate couple. Genesis 25, 19 through 23. In this particular reading, we have Yitzhak. At 40 years of age, he's praying for his barren wife. In fact, Vayatara, Vayatar, Yitzhak Laronai, Lenotrach, Echto. Literally translated, Isaac prayed passionately or richly for his barren wife. As a result, Adonai heeded his yatar, his rich, passionate prayer, and Rivka became pregnant. The same is seen to happen with Sarah, Rachel, and Leah as well. Note the length of time that Yitzhak, you know, prayed richly. Verse 26 says Yitzhak was 60 years old when she bore him, Ike and Easy. So that means that he prayed richly for 20 years. Again, by means of inspiration, the Spirit in us, guiding us, of the Holy Spirit throwing, flowing actually through Moshe, the latter was not seeking to write about all the details of these patriarchs and matriarchs, but rather to tell a theological and prophetic story within the purposes of redemption, that in mind. In the same context, Rivka will be seen worshiping the Lord with the same struggling intensity. The two boys in her womb are the expression of that struggle. Adonai clarifies, quote, There are two goyim, you know, two nations, two heathen, two Gentiles in your womb. From birth they will be two rival peoples. One of these peoples will be stronger or bolder than the other. Viravya avod tsair, and the macho guy will serve the little guy. Though twins are a special blessing, the word blessing may mean a large bag of issues to go along. No two boys, twins though these be, are alike, even when raised in the same exact environment. Our couple is faced with the challenges of raising children, yet the intensity of their relationship with one another and with Yah appears to be the prevailing factor that will see them through. I mean, well, I've titled this next section, Grabbing a Foot That is Heading for Your Face. Genesis 24, verses 24 through 26. Or, pardon me, I'm sorry, Genesis 25. Verses 24 through 26. I'll read it again just quickly to remind you. It says, When the time for her delivery came, there were twins in her womb. The first came out, the first to come out was reddish, covered all over with hair, with a coat, so they named him Asav. Then his brother emerged with his hand holding Asav's heel, so he was called Yaakov. Yitzhak was 60 years old when she bore them. So, the first boy comes out reddish in color and coated with hair like fur. They named him Esav. Esav means he's done, as in completely covered in hair like an older man. Because the second to arrive had gripped the elder's heel, he is named Yaakov, meaning both he catches by the heel or he supplants, supplants as well as he will be resultant or effective. It also has that meaning, though we never are necessarily taught that. It is quite common for a child to kick his or her way out, and not uncommon for a child to stretch out a hand or two as he or she is about to be birthed. These commonly known matters aside, the Lord inspires Moshe to write about these events in light of two different people groups, even though they're brothers, they're twins. But these two brothers do not merely have to do with two different nations, but moreover, two different lifestyles and belief systems, though directly related to each other. Understand, I've said that within these uh, portions within these studies, Moshe is not writing a history, but a historiology. He's writing 
for a, the purpose of showing redemptive history. And in that redemptive history, in that context, he's constantly showing the direction of two different belief systems, two different kinds of people. Even though they're raised in the same context, he's showing one person following the Lord God, the creator of the multiverse and king thereof, and the other person following his own flesh, his own desire. So that is what Moshe is repeating. And he will end his life by saying, I have offered you life and death. Choose life. So, this next little bit, I, I'm going to refer to it by a common uh, meme nowadays. You'll see this meme, and you'll see under it, well, that escalated quickly, right? So, Genesis 25, verses 27 through 34, I'll read it again. The boys grew, and Esau became a skillful, hunt, skillful hunter and outdoorsman, while Yaakov was a quiet man who stayed in the tents, plural. Itzhak favored Esau because he had a taste for game. Rivka favored Yaakov. One day when Yaakov had cooked some stew, Esau came in from the open field exhausted and said to Yaakov, Please let me gulp down some of that red stuff, that red stuff. I'm exhausted. This is why he's called it a dome. Yaakov answered, First sell me your, your rights as firstborn. Look, I'm about to die, said Esau. What use are my rights as firstborn? Yaakov said, First swear to me. So he swore to him, thus selling his birthright to Yaakov. Then Yaakov gave him bread and lentil stew. He ate and drank, got up and went on his way. Thus Esau showed how little he valued his birthright. So again, one day when Yaakov had cooked some stew, or literally, and stewed Yaakov some stew. And note that this had happened before Esau had come in from the field. Actually, he was in the process of cooking this stew when Asaph comes in. Asaph is weak and exhausted. In one singular sentence, the word red will be used three times to emphasize a characteristic in Asaph. What Asaph, what Asaph knows of food at this point is not even its smell, taste, or, or even its texture, but only color. He wants to, he wants what he sees, and he desires to, you know, quote-unquote, gulp it down in the here and now. Yaakov, knowing his brother's nature, stresses the here and now theme when he says, Mikra kahyom et biraktekali. Sell today, literally sell as of today, your birthright to me. In fact, Yaakov will say, the word today twice. Esav says, Hine, Anoki Halek Lamut, Vilamazeli Biroka. Behold, I am walking toward death, and what is this to me, this birthright? Now I'm trying to emphasize the, the way the Hebrew runs here. It, Esav is greatly belittling the birthright in comparison to his right now hunger. The second time Yaakov says today, Esau sells his birthright. V'yaakov natan, and Jacob had given, verse 34. Hebrew has no indication of tense or time. When we talk in English, we're, we, we learn from early on that there is you know, past, present, future tense or time. Hebrew doesn't do that, doesn't care about that. But rather, forward motion or intensive growth is the matter of Hebrew. If Hebrew wants to venture in speaking of time, or in this case, past tense, the text will often reverse the sentence structure, the sentence order. And sometimes that means it's emphasizing something. In verse 34 of our text, Jacob is mentioned before the word natan, or give. Remember, the Hebrew structure the Hebrew sentence structure is visio, meaning verb, subject, and then object. Starts with a verb. Verse 34 has this reversed to denote a past occurrence, as in Yaakov had given Esau some bread and lentil stew. He'd already done this. In their conversation about, about uh, birthright, Esau is sitting there with bread and stew in front of him. Okay. 
The action of the next sentence, all within the same sentence, the action of the ne next statement, is deliberate and fast-paced. Vyakol, vyashevet, vayakam, vayelech, vayyves et esav et haberakal. And he ate, and he drank, and he got up, and he walked out. And Esav mocked the birthright. Hmm. Well, in our story concerning Habikara, the birthright, I will note here that the word for birthright and the word for firstborn that we read in chapter 27 are one and the same word. The story of Esav is the story of a hunter and likely a big man. The Hebrew word given for him is rav, meaning macho, big. But he is also a man without a compass for the future. He cares only about the here and now. He also shows us that he despises, or that is, mocks his birthright as a heritage given to him, and far more valuable than a given bowl of stew. For this reason, we will say, well, pardon me, we will see a sav marry into one of the most warlike folk of the day, the Hittites, further emphasizing his here and now outlook. As opposed to a plan for the future, we see that Esau becomes Edom. He becomes a word meaning red, and he will be known as that for the rest of his life. He, the, the people that he spawns will be called Edom. They won't be called people of Esau so much. And I'm saying this because we note that red, the color red, is universally associated with heat or passion, the right now stuff. Edom will become more than a nation or tribe, but as much as a symbol. By the time you get into the, the era of the what's called the Beit Din prophets, the, the prophets who are uh, sending out words of judgment or words of quick you know, decision-making, that the Lord is going to do. By, by the time you get to those types of prophets, Elijah, Elisha, uh, Isaiah, and so forth, Edom, or Edom, is used as a symbol of those who are at odds with the existence of their brothers Israel. Just as Amalek will become a code word for folks who are savagely out to destroy Israel. The Haftarah for this portion of Torah is Malachi, or Malachi, chapter 1, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 7, wherein our God will say what I've also strove to say. I, he says, I love Yaakov. I loved Yaakov, but hated, or that is, rejected Esau, Edom. He further warns Israel not to despise Adonai by threatening his, or treating his altar with contempt or disrespect. Now, the, the same word used of Esau or Edom as despising the birthright is used in Malachi when it says, do not despise the Lord. He says that to Israel. What is to typify the priesthood of Israel is a, quote, covenant of life and peace, unquote wherein, quote, the true Torah was in his mouth and no dishonesty was on his lips. He walked with me in peace and in uprightness and turned many away from sin. A Kohen's lips, a priest's lips, should safeguard knowledge and people should seek Torah from his mouth because he is a messenger of Adonai Zevaot. Adonai, that meaning the Lord of armies. Despising one's birthright or heritage, be you Jew or be you Adam or, or, I don't know, be you a groundhog. Despising one's birthright or heritage is despising who, who you are. Self-loathing is repugnant and distasteful in our Lord's mouth. Don't do it. A suggested reading from the Brit Hadashah, the uh, Renewed Covenant, is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 17. Let me go ahead and turn there. I wasn't planning on it, but, you know, I like talking to you. I like, you know, actually bringing you to the text. So, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 17 says, Keep pursuing shalom 
what is shalom? We, we say it's peace, and yes, it does mean peace, but first and foremost, it means wholeness, or that is inner health. It means wholeness, inner health, or integrity, and then it means peace. And peace is not a lack of war. Peace is not a lack of anything. Peace is a person. We call him Yeshua. Keep pursuing shalom with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses out on God's grace, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and thus contaminates many, and that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who in exchange for a single meal gave up his rights as the firstborn. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to obtain his father's blessing, he was rejected. Indeed, even though he sought it with tears, his change of heart was to no avail. Well, the words in this portion, in that particular reading for root of bitterness, are from Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 16 through 21 wherein a person is described as having such a root springing up into him or her, with the telltale signs of denial and self-gratification as a cover. Esav, Edom, also had a very hard time with delayed gratification, and thus thought it better to throw himself into Bebelos. And I'm, I'm talking about from the uh, reading that we did in Hebrews Chapter 12, he throws himself into Bebelos, a gross crossing of lines, showing no affinity for Yah or his eternal word. I would rather encourage us all toward growth, the subject of Second Peter. We do not add nor take away from Yeshua, the eternal word made flesh, never. Rather, we add to our faith. We fully intend to grow by adding arete, meaning manning up, translated virtue, means manning up, and that, and we add to manning up, knowledge, and to knowledge, then self-control. To self-control, we intend to grow into savlanut, or patient endurance, and this is a, this is a tough thing. It's not a, it's not a quick self-gratification thing at all, anything but that but it is patient endurance nonetheless. We then look forward to chasidut. Hasidut is godliness or piety with the word hesed meaning grace. Uh, hasidut, of course, is where we get the term Hasidic Jew. Mm -hmm. And this grace leads us to the further ratcheting up of Torah-based lifestyle by means of that grace. And you can check that out in Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Do we by grace abolish the Torah? <laughs> Certainly not. No, we ratchet it up. Therein we are now able to see more clearly into adding that grand thing called brotherly love, or love of the brethren, which takes us to that ever wonderfully elusive agape, operating all within the unfathomable love of God. Edom's growth pattern is called Mashik. Mashik follows and hopes toward the growth of a man named Muhammad, who came into that final growth pattern by beheadings and taking little girls as sex slaves. My friends, there is a difference between the red-hot, flesh-oriented passion of Edom and the self-controlled or better spirit-controlled walk of our Savior. To be clear, to speak of the flesh in Paul's lingo is to say merely the flesh, the flesh only. You've, you've done away with any other part of you aside from the flesh. You're like every other animal. At the beginning of these notes, I spoke as a passionate, or I spoke of a passionate couple, but mere passion without the guidance of the Holy Spirit can lead to the path of Esav, Edom. May we never despise or seek to change him, but only allow him, only allow Yeshua to change us from glory to glory by Adonai the Spirit. Amen. Amen. I hope there's a little bit in here that you can take with you and maybe even allow this to cause us to be transformed rather than, rather than conformed to the pattern of this world. Amen. 
brothers and sisters, be blessed. And we'll talk more of this portion later. Thank you very much.